Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Claire Halpin. I am a visual artist and arts educator and curator. And for the purposes of this morning session, I am the host, but also I'm the learning programmer with the Tunleary Rattan Arts Office for this has been our spring learning program. This is the last event in our spring learning program. So uh, this morning's event is a uh, Meet the Artist Studio Visit with Marie Hensey. Um, so uh, just before we uh, go over to the studio visit, just to uh, let you know, very exciting, that uh, the DLR uh, Municipal Gallery, the Lexicon will be at the Lexicon, will be reopening on the 15th of May. So this is great news for us all to go and see real art in a real gallery with real people. So uh, all very exciting. So the exhibition that will be opening on the 15th of May is uh, called Tangle. It's an exhibition featuring the work of Ursula Burke, John Byrne, Alice Marr, Frida Mayock, John Carroll, uh, Dermot Seymour, and it curated by Michael Fortune. So a, a great lineup of artists there and great lineup of work. And it's an exhibition that was a collaboration between Michael Fortune, uh, working in collaboration with participants from Southside Travelers Action Group. Um, so that will reopen, that will open on the 15th of May. And there will also be a learning program to accompany that, and that will feature some studio visits with uh, participating artists Ursula Burke and John Byrne, as well as workshops, talks, children's workshops. So uh, those events will be going up online soon. Um, but back to today's event. So, um, uh, Marie Hensey, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, so, um, the format of this morning, I'm just going to do a quick intro to Marie's work. And uh, so Marie is a visual artist based in Clonmore, County Carlow. Her practices, practice encompasses drawing, sculpture, installation and collaboration. Over the past number of years, she has completed several public commissions, site specific installations, artist and residence programs and community, community based participatory art projects. Her work has been exhibited nationally and internationally in solo and group exhibitions. In 2018, Marie's solo exhibition uh, was, was entitled Palm Cest, and it was at the Carlow County Museum uh, with the opening by Nigel Monaghan of the National Museum. And um, so Marie will be talking about some of the work in that exhibition. Uh, recent, um, ex recent selected group exhibitions include uh, at the Signal Arts Centre in Bray, Brittle Fragile Westival and Westport Arts Festival that was last year, or sorry, two years ago. And Marie is a consistent exhibitor at Sculpture and Context in the National Botanic Gardens uh, and received an award in 2016 for award for outdoor sculpture in any medium. Um, um, in 2018, Marie's work was selected for the Royal Academy London, the 250th Summer Exhibition. That was a great occasion. It was selected uh, by and curated, well, it was curated by Grayson Perry. And um, so that's the big, you know, the big Royal Academy show, that's the one. And Marie's piece was actually on the telly. It was in the background at one point, you could just see it. And um, so that was a very exciting for all of us. Um, and uh, also as Marie has exhibited in Dunleary as part of the arrival exhibition in uh, the open submission arrival was in 2017. And that was selected by Gemma Tipton. Uh, Marie has received many awards, including most recently uh, 2021 Carlow County Council Individual Arts Grant Scheme. She has also been the recipient of Arts Links Bursary Awards, and she might talk a little bit about that, of how those awards have been used to uh, uh, further kind of uh, engage in residencies um, that she has set up for herself. Um, so, and sorry, I also should mention that Marie's also uh, her public art commissions. Most recently, uh, 2020 Middleton Educate Together National School Present for Arts Game. Uh, 2019 Gale School Nagara Maestri in Athlone. Public Art Commission at Clifton Community College in, sorry, Clifton Community School in Galway and in University Hospital Galway at the Acute Psychiatric Unit. Um, a, a large scale public art project with Grange Gorman called Pathways 2. It was a, a community based program and there was actually a publication of that um, 
that public art pro project came out last year. So many of these projects are documented both online and in the case of that one was documented in a beautiful uh, catalogue. Um, so uh, as I said, the format, will we will come to questions and answers at the end. I Every month when I do this, I say, oh yeah, we'll throw it open to the floor and I never get around to doing that. So I promise today and myself and Marie have agreed, we will stop talking at 12 o'clock and throw it open to the floor. Um, so if you have questions as we go along, if you want to put them into the chat, but hopefully we, not hopefully, sorry, we promise uh, that we will open it to the floor to just have more of a conversation uh, after Marie has done her presentation. presentations. Okay, so uh, Marie, I might hand over to you. Okay, Claire, thanks a million for that introduction. Um, it's certainly you've added up a load of things that I have to talk about. Um, I also want to thank um, DLR Arts Office for hosting this event and for the invitation because um, I don't think I've ever had this many people near the studio um, and it's great and I really want to thank everybody who is attending and for your time and interest. I think, I think it's really important just to describe where the studio is. Um, the studio is based in Clonmore, County Carlo. So it's a tiny, tiny rural village which borders um, Wicklow and Carlo. And in order to get to the studio, um, you can just imagine a very small rural village with a small little laneway off. And you drive down the laneway, you go through a farmer's yard, you drive down another bit and you come to a grassy verge and you're thinking that this can't be anybody down here. And you keep going. And right at the very end is an old farmhouse and our studio. And when I'm talking about our studio, I share the studio space with my husband, Mark Ryan, who's a sculptor. So we have one big space and then we have two individual his and hers spaces. And um, so very lucky to have that. And when Claire was talking about um, the public art commissions, I collaborate with Mark on these very large scale public art commissions. But today is an opportunity to really focus in on my studio practice, because as artists, we do a lot of collaboration. We do a lot of education, but this is an opportunity to talk about studio practice. And that's what I'm really going to focus in on. So when you see where we are in a few minutes, we don't have any broadband. So I was really keen to get you into the studio. So I've asked, I asked my son Connor to pre-record a video and almost as if you're in the space. Um, so I felt that that was important. And he kind of asked me questions as if you were there with me, because I think you probably asked some yeah. questions. And um, I think we can't. I can't go any further without saying in a funny way this last year because of the restrictions of COVID most of the public artwork or any of the engagement work has stopped so I've almost had a year-long residency and um, and it's really given me a chance just to stay with my studio practice and oftentimes you think before COVID I would have thought if I had a two-week residency I'd be really excited by that but in fact a year nearly isn't enough. I'm not wishing another pandemic, but it's amazing how you submerge yourself into your studio practice and it becomes active and it, the year has really flown. So I'm going to stop talking at this point and I'm going to play the video. So Pia, I'm just wondering, can you, yeah. so hopefully this gives you an insight into where we are and the work that I'm doing at the moment. And then we're going to look at some closer images of my work on a PowerPoint presentation. And then we're going to stop and try and get some conversation going. And if there's any questions, just put them up in the chat. The studio is a very large space. And um, so we have one very, very large space that we do a lot of production in. And then I have my own intimate space. And I suppose by inviting everybody into this space, it's like revealing um, the last 20 years of my life um, and sort of preparing for this virtual studio visit has really made me look at everything that I have in this space. And what it is, is it's like documenting me. That um, it's like saying, well, here's my diary, open it and have a good look at it. Because 
the work that's here is very, very personal to me. And I think the work that I make is documenting and archiving events in my life. So when I make work, I kind of processing things, but it takes a while for me to discover what it is. Um, you might make a piece, it feels right to make it, and maybe five years later, you understand what was the influence. So if you were to say to me, well, what inspires Marie Hensi as an artist? I actually couldn't necessarily say because I surround myself with things. They begin to make sense and have meaning. And then I make work out of that. And I will be giving you a tour of the studio and that might make more sense when we get to the individual pieces that are around me. But you're welcome into the space. Um, and oftentimes, now, because we're so remote, we don't really get that many people calling to us. Um, and sometimes, like, you feel so privileged to have your own studio. Like, everybody, whether you're an artist or not, deserves a space that's yours. And it deserves to be your space and to fill it with whatever you want to have in it. And that's what is so exciting about these artists conversations, that everybody's space is different, but you're coming into mine. So I was talking to you earlier on about COVID and how the work that I've been making for the last year has been around touch um, and the fact that COVID means we're in a crisis of touch. So the title of the work I'm making really is Touch Hunger, The Anatomy of Touch. And these bowls were the start of that journey. Um, so the bowls are canvases and it's really important that the bowl is taken, its context, its use is taken away. These are three dimensional drawings. The bowl is a surface for me to make marks on. Um, and I would, was hoping to, when people would view this work, that you'd eliminate what the function of the bowl is and see it as a beautiful thing to hold and to touch. So I was really particular about the surface. Um, I got a local ceramicist, Christine Van Bussel, to um, cast these bowls and they're unglazed. So even without any drawing on them, they are a really beautiful, beautiful shape to hold. And I made all of these drawings blindfolded because if you imagine once you your eyes are shut and you feel the bowl, your bowl, the surface, the edge, you know that you're feeling a boundary. Um, and all my drawings, and actually most of the work I do, involves using Indian ink. And the blackness of Indian ink really, really excites me. And also, I rarely use colour because um, I feel once you work in monochrome, you really focus in on the mark. So these bowls, the journey of these bowls is really, really important. And I, I, I am so attached to each of them. Each of them has been drawn on the inside and the outside. So the whole surface is considered. And again, it's really, um, they were very, they were very immediate. They were very instant. And it was almost having to stop yourself and know when the drawing was complete. But the next stage for me after, and I'll be showing some images of my work. Um, I use some text, just some abstract marks. And then I um, actually began then and to drop the bowls and to break the bowls and then to reconstruct um, the bowls. Um, and by reconstructing them, they weren't always complete because when you drop a ceramic piece, you're, you're, you're going to lose some of it. But I, I don't feel this work is complete at all. Like, I think this is just a starting of something. Um, but in a very, really important part of the experience of COVID and how to express it. So I think what I'd like for you just is to see some of the things that I have in my studio. And if you were here in life, you'd be there, you'd be sort of being able to pick up things and to 
choose what you found interesting. But I had this conversation with uh, two friends of mine that we've been staying in touch, and um, they're artists, Anne Henderson and Naomi Draper, and we were just talking about are artists hoarders or collectors? Because if you look, I've had, say, these forks, these bits of metal, my books, um, my collection of tools, and everything has its place and everything makes its mark. But I see myself as a collector and um, the metal bits that I have in my studio are pieces that were unearthed when we were um, when we were making the studio. Every time you dug a bit of earth or land, another implement. Um, so you're surrounded by the character of the metal, but also of the characters that might have used the um, implements. So when you're surrounded by all of this, you're never lonely because it's like, you know, these, these, these just are so beautiful and used. You wonder about their history and the history of the people that use these tools. Um, so you surround yourself by them and then they become a personality and then they somehow become integrated into your work. So I'd say for people, because I, 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 I would never see myself as a hoarder, um, so I'm going to say I'm a collector, not a hoarder. Um, and these, these pieces here are all parts of work that I've made. Um, I use a lot of text. I've also, um, in, over the years, have done a lot of work with ash, um, where I've burnt a lot of letters, photographs, um, and have made drawings with the ash. And again, everything I feel I do is a drawing, and a lot of the work is a drawing in three dimensions. So that gives you a sense. I've got books, um, I've got sketchbooks. I don't know, I have a sling. Not that that's of any use, but it might be to get somebody out of the studio. Um, so yeah, the, that's very typical. I, I mean, I haven't, it's not something that I order, I just add to and take away from. The museum jars, a bit like the bowls, are my canvases and on this table here is, is a series of works um, that I have I've exhibited um, and again each of the jars are filled with something that I'm very very connected with. It's past work and um, I did a lot of work um, using ash where I burnt photographs and letters and items that, I belong, that belonged to me but the ashes the quality of the ash, I just feel, make really beautiful marks and, and drawings. So again, it's that concept of drawing in three dimensions. Um, this piece here is um, anthracite and uh, chalk. And when the anthracite meets the chalk, it really makes a beautiful line. And again, it's something that you can't control or meditate how it's going to work. So there's a real excitement in that. And I had an exhibition in the Carlo County Museum, and this was a site specific work um, where there's a part of the um, museum that explores um, a thing called dancing the calm, where in, historically people had to make fuel using anthracite. So I wanted to make these drawings in the museum jars using anthracite and chalk. This table is my, I'll call it my collector's table because it probably has a bit of everything. It has work in progress. It has work that could be potentially something. So it's, it's one of those, it's, it's not a display, but it it's, has a bit of everything. So what I have here is, again, it's work in progress. That's why I think I need another year in lockdown. Um, I was really fascinated. I kept finding these masks and I, everywhere, and I'm sure everybody's the same. These are the medical meant to be disposable. Um, and so I began to document these masks everywhere I saw them, and I put the, the GPS coordinates on the image. And then I just began to think about how 
the masks now have become part of our landscape. Um, and I began then to make casts of masks, now not masks that I found, but just trying to recreate the shapes that I saw in the photographs. So again, this technique took, it just took ages to get it so it looked like, the, gave it lightness. Um, and it, so a lot of my work I use plaster um, and these are masks that I've cast in plaster. And again, it's work in progress. I'm not really sure where it's going, but it's something that I want to develop. Another part of the mask journey was that I left the masks outside on um, metal plate. So the metal plate rusted and then the mask took on the patina of the um, rusted metal. So I, I, think there, there, I think there's really something in this, but I'm not really sure it's work in progress, I suppose. Um, so that's my journey with masks. Oh, what was really interesting was that I tried to destroy the mask, but because there's so much plastic, the only thing you could do is burn it. It's the, like these are going to just really destroy um, our landscape because they're not biodegradable. But the only way, so then I began to take casts of the partly destroyed um, mask. And again, something, now that I'm seeing it, it's definitely somewhere, something that I wanted to develop on further. I'm just not sure, but that's where we're at with that. This is just some of my ashes still, again, work in progress, but you know, it's, it's something that you really have to work with. Like I've had oh, so many different type and sizes of sieves to sieve out the ash so that you get, get it to a point where it's making a drawing. Um, so it's not something that you just arrive at, it's a process and then you decide, well, no, I'm happy with that outcome. So um, I have, yeah, this is a very, very fine sieve. So if you sieve the ash, very, very fine grains come out. So again, that's part of more work in progress. And um, over the last number of years, I've been collecting shopping lists and I'm I kind of feel it's almost like a, a portrait of somebody um, by the very, the way they write out their lists about things they want, the way they short make, the way they describe what they want. I, I just find the list and I just wonder about the character and the personality behind it. And I've been using these lists to make my current work, which is these works on plaster. Again, I've cast plaster panels and I have drawn the shopping list into the plaster and then I've used Indian ink um, to um, on the surface and then sand it back. But I'm going to show you that process. And to get to this point where to create that surface to draw into has taken time, but it's, I'm really, really pleased with the way that this has worked out. And again, I imagine I'll be working. These are all just sketch ideas. And I've been working my way through. Um, again, technique, but also there's no, every single time you do it, it turns out differently. But I think that's really part of the process. I'm going to just show you how I make this the plaster panel because it just took me so long to arrive at a surface that's so smooth that I could draw into. So um, I first of all prepare the timber um, because what I want is the plaster to, to adhere to the back of this. So I've given it a really good scratching and I've drilled these little holes for the plaster to grab onto. Um, so you start off, I start off by making a frame and the accuracy at the beginning is just so important because otherwise you have plaster spilling everywhere if you don't do it properly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour in plaster, then I'm going to set in my timber backing. And by the time the plaster sets, it'll have adhered then to the timber panel. So again, I've been using plaster for years and I just find mixing with your hand 
gives you the much, uh, like you can really kind of feel when the plaster's right. And I often wonder <laughs> when a dermatologist looks at my hands, they're gonna say one hand is drier than the other, but um, it does give you a direct contact with the liquid and the powder. Um, plaster's a funny one because it really depends on the condition. Like if there's a lot of humidity, it changes how much water versus plaster you mix. So you're just relying on a feeling of when you have enough powder versus liquid. And the one thing I discovered, and this is why I'm making the panels like this, that air bubbles right to the top. So this is why I pour the plaster in first and then put the timber in afterwards because the bubbles are going to rise to the top and they'll be at the back of the frame. So I'm just going to pour it in and I'm just going to tap as I do it. This is where we demonstrate it and it goes all over the place, but it hasn't. Okay, so that's about enough. So I'm tap, 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 tapping. And you can see that the bubbles are all coming up to the surface. Now, so I just gently press it down. Now what's happening there is by rocking it, all that plaster is going into the surface of those holes and it means that it's going to adhere. Okay, so best thing to do is to leave that for at least an hour and a half for it to set. So here's one I prepared earlier. Uh, so, so you imagine that that's like that, okay? So I take out my timber and it's stuck and then you're left with this absolutely beautiful, smooth surface um, to work on. Um, what I do then is I have various um, implements. It's amazing how, like, I've got needles, I've got lots of different things. But you know the way, like, in my studio, I know exactly what this will do and what this will do. And then I literally draw into the surface. I used to use gesso panels quite a bit, but with th these plaster panels, you can dig in really, really, really deep. And it gives you a surface that you can scratch into. Um, it's beautifully smooth on the areas that you don't work into. So what I've done here is, so that's your canvas, made canvas. So I scratch into it and then I apply Indian ink to my scratched in surface. So one of the days I was using sandpaper for a good while and um, I found that the sandpaper would got really clogged up and I ran out of a grade of sandpaper and I found some wire wool and I now realize that that is the really best thing to use. So then I begin to draw into the surface using the wire wool. And as I said before, now I'm not going to continue this on because there's a point where I really, it's not really, I need to be on my own making this because I need to know when I want to stop. But by scratching in with the wire wool, it just gently removes the Indian ink and then your drawing appears. And again, each one is completely different. But what I'm, what I love about it is that beautiful smooth surface versus the drawn into um, mark making and then the uncertainty of how it's going to end up. So that's the, um, the, the that gives you hopefully an insight into the studio and what's going on all around. I've noticed I've said a lot of the time it's work in progress, but you know yourself, you don't know Things are complete, but they're always evolving. Yeah, Adair, well, and firstly, Marie, just is such a beautiful video. It's just absolutely gorgeous. I'd say um, Connor will be out the door with her, just ringing him, better tell him to clear his deck for her. It's because I know we had talked about whether about doing it live and then you were saying like doing the pre-recorded, but it. I can only speak for myself as I do with uh, each month with these visits that it honestly felt that I was just there. 
and could have reached and touched. And I know a few people have put in the chat that surface that you spoke of with the plaster panels. And um, as with many of these studio visits, every visit involves artists doing a lot of this mm -hmm. and a lot of this. <laughs> but um, I think what will um, just as I said, it just be absolutely beautiful documentation. I'm just talking it through so gently, and I'm sure we will have questions coming back to that. But um, but we might do. Will we move to the slideshow? Yeah, yeah. Unless there's yeah. anything coming up that you just want to, you know, as as uh, just the well, just be, be uh, yummy surface was mentioned, and everyone wants to do, uh, come and touch the uh, surfaces of the. Uh, 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 Rachel Verdon has said brilliant practice and presentation and amazing concepts, a uh, great video indeed, very insightful and studio space and I think this is what, like I'm not saying what differs with these studio visits but certainly the emphasis, it's not an artist interview, it's very much about the work in progress and the working processes and as you said in the video of this, your studio practice how you work as an artist within your space and the generosity of you in bringing us there um, this morning. Um, uh, Barbara has said, it's like your church, Marie. And like your church. And, and your Sinead O'Connor. <laughs> your many altars to creative ceremonies. We might just have all have a little quiet moment there. Uh, thanks, Barbara. Um, what a tranquil uh, place to work, very interesting. Um, it is a questions come in. I, I, Deirdre, Deirdre Rogers, the question, but I think we'll hold that until after the slideshow is in relation to whether it was a conscious decision not to use color. Um, and Orla Burke said, What a grafter! There you go. Um, and Isabel Tony has mentioned your collection of tools, and I, I think that's certainly something that we will be. She said, Beautiful work, beautiful studio. So, interesting. Um, Isabel, I went to college in. Uh, Gala Shields in the College of Textiles and that was my starting point and Isabel was one of my colleagues was in my year and actually my degree show was all around tools and drawings of tools so it's interesting how it all comes back you know um, but that's another conversation sure we'd start the powerpoint anyway yeah. and great um as I said keep the if you want to keep the questions coming via the chat and um, we will um Okay, so uh... and I, I, even as I'm doing the PowerPoint, Claire, if there's questions, honestly, I'm happy because I think it's really great if people are here um, and start at, at the beginning. That's I think that's after going to. I'm going to stop share there. Hang on for a sec. Um, but interesting, I see Antonio's there. Antonio's there, and uh, we spent a month in um, a town in Italy called. Uh, Spoleto. So ciao Antonia. Antonia. But um, you can't, a lot of the plaster, the reason why I'm using plaster a lot is when you see everywhere in Italy there's text on walls, there's text scratched into the frescoes and it still has stayed with me and it's very, has very much influenced me trying to seek that surface of the plaster. So yeah, that's the first slide. So that's the view. Can everyone see the screen? Okay, P, is that coming up? Okay, great. Uh, sorry, I had to flick backwards there for a sec. Sorry, Marie. Um, sorry, go on. Yes. So no. if you give me a shout, yeah, when you want to move the, uh, when you want me to move the slides along. Yeah. So that's the the studio view, and it's it's uh, it's uh, really lucky that the doors fold all the way back, and even in winter times, you've often opened the doors out, and it's into this really really old. Um, orchard so the light and the tranquility is a it's a really beautiful place to work so if you go to the next slide there so um what's really interesting is the online presence over the last year um, and i found um i've actually used an awful lot of online resources um to support my practice and also to feel um, connected and not invisible. So I joined um, this online group called Drawing Box International. And um, they are a group, it's a group where we, I suppose it's people who approach drawing in a contemporary type of way. So one of the, um, one of the 
things they wanted us to do was to do a drawing a day and to draw the same subject matter over a period of 30 days. And the work that we've made, six pieces are going to be selected, which will be exhibited in, in France, in Brittany and in Paris. So I was still looking at the shopping lists um, and I mentioned that in the video that I've been collecting shopping lists for years. And I really feel again, the shopping lists are like portraits. So I've been drawing the same line from a shopping list over and over again. And if you want to go to the next slide, um, Claire, what I do is I'm always looking for different type of substrates to work on. So um, I was fascinated over lockdown, the amount of deliver delivering and packaging that has been sent to all our houses. And a neighbor of mine got a really beautiful package delivered. I'm not going to do a project placement, but um, it, it was a black box and there was beautiful graphics on the box. So what I did was I cut the box up into A5 sections and I left some of the graphics from the box. So they then determined the way I might draw on it. But um, so I am the... I have used letra set in this one and I've been masking up areas and um, but I'm literally drawing the same sentence over and over again. So if you go to the next slide. So if you see in this slide here in the corner section there, you can see a part of the graphics of the packaging. Can you see that there? And I can see it's in colour, Marie. What? It's in colour. There's <laughs> some colour there. Yeah. It's in colour. So these are A5 sizes, and that was one of the specifications by Drawing Box International, that it would either be a square format or else it'd be A5. And I think it was quite challenging for me to work on the flat. And again, it's trying to make the work as spontaneous as I can. And when I draw text, I try and lose what the text is. So you're looking at a rhythm um, of the language as opposed to being able to decipher what it is I'm writing. But it's a repeated sentence over and over again for 30 days. And it, they'll physically be exhibited? They will be. So we send six, you choose six out of 30, mm -hmm. and then it'll, they, you send your six pieces that you've chosen, and then that will be, they will be exhibited. Okay. So um, I think. I like the reverse, like I'm working, I'm working black and white and white and black, um, but I think I've made my selection almost. But it's been a great resource because, you know, it means then for the last year when there hasn't been any exhibitions and we've all been kind of si silenced that you have this online content. And it's the same with Instagram, actually. It has made the last year you've been in contact with people and you're not invisible. It, because your work there, you know, digressing slightly, but your because uh, your work was featured was it the, this week on the No Name Collective. That's right. Yeah, but there's an awful lot. I mean, the No Name Collective, you submit your work and then they select. You know, um, again, it's it's across all nationalities, um, uh, Claire, and 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 that's really interesting that you're you're alongside people from all over the the world, and yeah. that's the same with Drawing Box International. That's it, because that's it, even in seeing the images, all right, so, you know, that kind of pairing, and you kind of go, oh, somebody decided to put the work alongside that artist, but it, it, like it, 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 um, it's an interesting conversation then between the two works, even though they're, you know, online and in a small format, but... Um, and somebody's curating. Yes, yes. You, yeah. And you've no control over that. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, but it does make you feel that you're part of a community when, when there's been nothing happening in reality. But it's that thing as well, where like those two works would may never meet in true, true life, you know, and here they are alongside each other. So for viewers, it has created a dialogue between the works that, you know, uh, so it just it, it just from that online format. Um, so the next slide, Claire. Yeah, so this is again, um, what's the repeat sentence? I hear Barbara. Barbara, do you know what? I'm not going to tell you because it's so personal. But, um, but it's come up when somebody's asked me, what is that repeat 
sentence. But if you take this slide, um, Barbara, all the complete sentence is in it. So I've I, I've randomised it, but I prefer. And that's what I love about text is actually the not knowing what it is really makes you have to think and mm. figure it out. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's abstracting the letters to being symbols or yeah. marks. Um, and I think, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, um, so the shapes, the white shapes are just trying to take it, like it's a random type shape. It's almost like the randomness. Of, you know the way when you find a shopping list it could be written on the back of a cigarette box or it could be written on the back of a torn up bit of cardboard or plasterboard I mean the, the lists I have are on all sorts of things so yeah. it's a random type shape but it, it, it's isolating the words and the letters so the like this is the actual drawing and then this this of white Terry, can you just to explain? Terry, just to, I mean, now that I'm looking at this, uh, so the the drawing is the whole thing. Oh yeah. Yeah, we've it's not black, just that part. Yeah. We've got the black packaging box, and I've masked it off and I've sprayed it with a white mat. Okay. Yeah. And then I've used Letraset, which is a hundred years old. Yeah. Um, to Very scatter, hard to scatter the words. Yeah. And it's interesting that kind of him using a pre-existing surface, but also pre-existing letters. I think that's like an interesting thing between the, the handwritten letters, which you've abstracted into marks and then choosing these very definite marks that are manufactured as such. Absolutely. I don't know if you can buy a letter set anymore, but no, I uh, there's variations uh, of it, but uh, it's not quite the same as the original uh, pages and pages that you would get of it. Um, would you have used letter set from your design days or from? No, 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 no. Just oh. I, um, I, I, ha I ha I've had it for years. I and mean, you know the way you have something for years. It's a bit yeah. like a question: Are we hoarders or collectors? I have this letter set for years, and I'm only yeah. using it now. Yeah. And a question right. came up. Uh, uh, Pauline was asking about, am I copying the writing? I'm not. I just get caught up. I get caught up in the rhythm of the language. And, you know, so I don't I'm not trying to copy. Like this is an example of um, some of, of, of hundreds of shopping lists. But, you know, if you just read through it, you can either say, is it a woman? Is it a young person? Is it an old person? But they, they really build up a, a profile of the person. But we had that conversation before, Claire. About yeah, and actually my, my mother is here this morning with, uh, I think two of my sisters are here as well. Myself and Marie have spoken about <laughs> the deciphering of one's mother's, uh, now my mother's handwriting is actually very beautiful handwriting, quite similar to the piece on the right there. Um, but it's our code, our idiosyncratic code that you're standing in the shop going, this must be something that is in the shop, but I don't know what. Uh, I had a few, uh, uh, three hands was one. So I don't know whether, and we won't start a quiz, but three hands was a very, was a, a few years ago, a few many years ago, there was a washing up liquid called three hands. And so that was three hands was just a oh, whoop liquid. Sorry, three hands whoop liquid was the code that she had for that. And then yogurt, uh, F O T F. Marie, you know this one. F O what? F O T F. It's a flavor of yogurt. Oh, fruit of the forest. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So oh. that's just an example of some of the codings. But it is that thing. I, I, I like joking aside, but that deciphering, and as I said, that completely personalized language that. <laughs> is within that the person who has written it can read it as such or in, in uh, understand it but eva commented there saying the right one looks like the ingredients for a christmas cake <laughs> yeah i actually was looking at that one's going it's very sweet it's only a quite a sweet tooth there um but as it but like in a similar way it's the i did i just said how much you can tell about the, i wasn't sure about the one on the left was i was looking at the body oh breakfast bars sorry is the last line there but even people's variations of uh broccoli uh like uh, people spell broccoli is another thing like but once you like it ties in go back to your packaging one of it being a pre-existing surface and that immediacy of some of you know pulling a piece of paper and reusing a piece of paper like the back of an envelope 
yeah. you know, that already has a history. I mean, you would rarely, well, I know my mother certainly would, you know, we certainly wouldn't take out a fresh piece of paper to write a shopping list. That would be like a flagrant yeah. waste of a good clean sheet of paper. Uh, but uh, yeah, be, and even the, the folds in it and the crossing off and the system of it as well. No, I, I think that again, a bit like the tools that I have in the studio, you're, you're kind of caught up in the character and the person that wrote it, you know. Mm. So you, you, you get your studio is full of personalities that they don't know that, they, you know, they haven't a clue that you've got this, you know, that you've, you've got this list. Yes. Yeah. Um, and some, some actually, when I find them, I'm not that particularly interested. And then there's some that I am, you know, so mm. I'm, I'm a selective hoarder of shopping lists. I do. We'll give you the, the title collector for today. I think everyone's <laughs> quite defensive as art has been called hoarders or collectors <laughs> or the ability to walk past a skip and not look into it. <laughs> um, will, I, will I go on? Yeah. So these are the these are a close up of the plaster panels um, and you know it's taken as I said in the video it really has taken a lot of uh, time to get the smooth surface of, of, of the plaster panel and I'm going back to the time that I was in Spoleto and there was a, a big um, a beautiful fortress um, on the top of the hill in the in the town and um, what they did was they converted the fortress into a prison. So the fortress had all these really beautiful frescoes. And then the prisoners began to write on top of the frescoes and write their own language and engraving into it. Um, and I remember being there and I was probably more fascinated by the script made by the prisoners than the actual beauty of the frescoes. And I, it's nearly two years since we were there, but I've been seeking a way to try and represent language, but try and hide it. And I think I finally arrived at works that do, do that because you're seeing it's a plaster piece. It's been scraped into a bit like the prisoners did. And then it's been worked back. So you see language and you don't see it, but it's certainly not definable. And funny the dimension of this because um, the project that you're involved with, a lot of people's work has now become 15 centimetres by 15 centimetres. And I'm just mentioning the PLID project. Um, it's, it's, the deadline has closed, but it's been a project that Claire and Madeline have been curating and it's the people have been invited to submit artworks. Um, it's completely accessible to everybody to make a comfort blanket for the nation. Is that it? Yeah, so yeah, basically we put a call out in uh, February, uh, well that was the day to um, uh, artists, crafts people, creatives, makers, doers, tapping into that um, need that people had during the pandemic maybe to return to more kind of traditional crafts or just that thing of making and doing. Um, and the call out was uh, around what has brought you to we the uh, the concept which Madeline developed was around the uh, sorry Madeline's my sister Madeline Elliot who should be here today I think she is here today uh, was around this idea of a blanket but the the square format was kind of coming back to this granny crocheted squares of old so these will be assembled now when we put the call out we had no idea what the response would be and it has <laughs> grown and grown and which is why we put the call out in the First of February, thinking of kind of St. Bridget's blanket of kind of this idea of extending uh, a blanket to cover a community. And uh, to date, we have we're coming up close to a thousand artworks in so many different materials and so beautiful works. And many people have accompanied, I want to start well enough now, many people have accompanied the work with short texts saying what they has brought them comfort during uh, comfort or solace uh, during the pandemic. And that has ranged from so many different things, but the groundswell of positivity around the project um, has just been quite incredible. And Marie, yourself and myself have spoken about it. And just the simplicity of the college was around the 15 centimeter square. And as I said, uh, our plan next is yeah, to assemble them, exhibit them, 
and uh, and in light of today, and hope you don't mind me, re me doing a product placement here, but uh, in light of today coming into darkness into light, the works that made are going to be ex uh, exhibited, but also will be auctioned for uh, Pieta House. Um, so uh, just uh, as, a, a, as a, a follow on from the work. So Marie, thank you for uh, mentioning that and thank you for you and Mark submitting absolutely stunning, stunningly beautiful works. Um, so yeah, we're very proud to have you as part of the project and it has been it just such a positive right from the get go, just going, yep, yeah, let's do this. And yeah, and your encouragement as well. That's me over for the minute now, Marie, back to you. <laughs> I'm good to get a breather from my voice. So um, if you want to go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is again, another plaster piece. Um, and I think what's, there's no way of, of replicating or predicting each piece turns out completely different. You just, when you saw in the video, I was draw I was revealing the drawing using wire wool, but you, you you can't predict for any time what's going to happen. And that's are you even repeating the same process. I know we did once again it's something we've spoken about at length, like repeating the process. It, it's it's not like a formula, uh, or uh, like even saying I'm going to do this step and this step. The like that gesture of and where you were talking about the marks, it, like they're appearing and disappearing or hovering somewhere in between. And the gesture that you use, like the with the even with the wire wool, you know, the the action, you know, the pressure, the, the amount of variables within that. Yes. It's just like the multiple, multiple, like as I said, you could repeat the whole process again and again, and they never they will never be the same. No, but that's what's that's what's great about it too, you know. Yeah. Um, and if some days that you're casting panels and they just don't work, and I, it just it's amazing how you get a run of a something and, and it works out really well. But every time it's completely different. And I mean, it was interesting actually where you were talking about the you know in your preparation for the panels where you had the drilled in parts as well, and you said you scratched the surface. For me, it was kind of thinking it's really like there's another drawing preserved in there. Yeah. as well <laughs> so it's like uh, i know it was part of the process of making the pieces but uh um so this is again another piece and it's in the hands of my lovely friend mary louise who had a, a 40th birthday celebration the other day yeah right so, um, it is as an artist it's great to be able to share work and to give it but um so um Again, it's 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 a drawing, and I'm drawing the same same sentence over and over again. And so my work will last for years because I'll have to get on to the next um, next on the list. <laughs> um, and I think the smoothness, and you've seen these panels, Claire. The smoothness of the surface is it's it's it nearly looks like a print on a mm -hmm. on a something. But it's great to have. I'm so. I feel I've really got somewhere now, um, mm. and I now am very happy with my canvases and my surfaces. So back to the masks, and um, I have, uh, you know, the way some days you're not in the studio and you're walking along, I see a mask, I photograph it, and I feel that that's great, I've done a piece of work today. But I am really fascinated by the shapes and our landscape changing. And I've had conversations with people about these masks. And um, some people say, well, they're not deliberately thrown on the ground. And um, they just drop out of pockets. But everywhere you go, these masks, I'm finding them. So what I do is I take a photograph and then I record the GPS coordinate of where I found the masks. So I do think our landscape is changing because of COVID. And I think um, I just worry about the, how are these, certainly they won't be biodegradable because there's so much plastic in them. But, um, so this is, a, I suppose, a series of works that's ongoing. Um, and I've hundreds of photographs, but this is just to give you an idea of some of the locations, the shapes and the way that the masks fall. And they're there for ages then because I go back and I see the same one and it's become 
sort of mashed into the ground and he almost disappears. And I think there is that thing as well, which kind of connects with obviously all the other work of the the mark that has been left, like I mean the evidence of the human form. Yeah. The, the trace of human in, also the, breath in, in the mask. Yeah, I wouldn't be at all like inclined to pick it up because you're thinking somebody has, has been breathing and has left left their breath mark into that mask. Yeah, but it, it does, yeah. Um so then I took Cass. Now again, this has been taking um, a really a long time. Oh, I think I have one here. Yeah, like the masks. Um, like they're they're really really lightweight. Um, and I was trying to get them. So when you look at that, it almost looks like a landscape. Um. Um, as opposed, you're not sure what you're looking at. Is it a piece of fabric? Um, I've taken away, um, I think somebody said something about the, the elastic. I've taken away the elastic actually. And what I've done is I've cast just the masks and trying to capture the shapes that I've seen in the photographs. Mm -hmm. So um, I just think that when you look at it, if you, if you hadn't probably have seen the previous slide, I wonder what people think they are looking at because the shadows as well in the images that I've taken make them very landscaping. Um, yeah, it's like they're kind of hovering between being like nearly the previous more look like nearly kind of portraits or traces of portraits. Whereas, and even when you had them in the studio, they kind of assembled together, they kind of started looking more like a landscape. But I think, and it's back to this of looking at work online as well, even the kind of scale, it's very hard to because there's. There's no human reference within this image. It's hard to gauge the scale, you know. And but you're casting them to actual size. Oh, they are cast actual size, yeah. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, I think I think you'd have to see multiples of these somewhere to mm. give them impact. And I'm not so sure. Like I'm not thinking of gallery setting or anything like that. I mean, I. Um, so th this is definitely, I think it's, it's, it's always great to document your work and to photograph it because I'm looking at this now. Is it a finished piece or is it not? You know, when you have mm. it in the studio and it's piled up amongst other things, you keep thinking, I, I'll get back to that. But like, it's great to stop every so often, document and photograph it. And then you mm. feel the photograph in itself is almost like a finished piece of work. Yeah, it's starting with the jars and it kind of relates to what you were saying there about like the context in which these works might be shown. Like you do, do give a lot of consideration to the context of where your work is seen and having seen the jars both in the Carlow, um, Carlow County Museum and it were, they were also exhibited in the model in Sligo. Yeah, and in Asia. And in Asia, it's so very different. Like, I mean, one, two, well, both the model and Asia, uh, with, that was in um, visual in Carlo. So yeah. like, a, like a, a humongous white cube space. And yeah. the way you put them placed was like, it, it's just completely different to the more kind of, let's say the, 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 the glass cases that they were within in Carlo County Museum, like just a, a very different reading of the work and what they were placed beside. Um, you want to go down to the slide with the glass yeah, jars? Because um, I'm conscious, Claire, it is 12 o'clock now yeah. and we did say... Yeah, we did. And um, we'll yeah. stop. Just so where, where would I go? Sorry. Like, you were mentioning about the jars, or yeah. The, yeah, the museum jars. And we can come back. We'll stop at the museum, Jarvis, if you can see it on my PowerPoint. There we go. Yeah, these, this is fine, actually. Yeah. Um, there is another slide with, but it doesn't matter. We'll stop here because I think we're going to stop, Claire, anyway. Here. That's stop. it. Yeah. So this, this is, um, yeah, so you see that it was exhibited in the Carla County Museum. I was in Paris and I went to the Museum of hunting and nature. And Sophie Cal was an artist who did a site specific work for the museum. So you went into the museum and her work was integrated. And so you didn't know whether it was a museum piece or was it a, a piece of art. And I really, I had been working using these museum jars anyway. And I really thought 
um, it would be really nice rather than putting it into a white, which uh, like it's been in the Royal Scottish Academy, it's been in the Cabinet of Wonders, but I wanted to bring it back into a museum setting. Mm -hmm. And Carlow County Museum, the people, it, it also allows people who wouldn't necessarily go to visual, which is just across the road, would access an artist's work in context of a museum. So okay. the work was, I mean, it was, it, it was a, a really, a, a really lovely opportunity to exhibit, but a lovely op opportunity to exhibit in the context of a museum. And so Claire, I'm going to just that was set up through, wasn't it? There was a you had initiated a conversation with Nigel Monaghan and around yes. getting actually getting the acquiring the museum jars in the first. Well, I, I had got a few museum jars. They were advertised on VAI, and I thought, look, this these are just beautiful. And I knew I was looking for something to draw with. And then I kind of got greedy, and I said, I don't have enough of them. And I rang Nigel Monaghan in. A natural history museum and um said look at any chance you have a spare few jars so i was being really optimistic and got the van and mark was saying oh, look marie really you know you're <laughs> and right enough we went down to the bowels of the um natural history museum and there was all these jars that were no longer usable so it was really a fabulous what a yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah absolutely so will we just have a look at some questions, Claire, because I'm just really conscious that I'm for everybody that's here, if they want, if there is anything, we've got no, time. Would it stop share then? Yeah. Yeah. OK, um, so if anyone has a question they want to ask at this point, if they want to, if they can virtually put their hand up, as in put their under reactions at the bottom of your screen, you can put your hand up. Here, do you want to unmute and Great, thank you. Hi, Marie, how are you? I'm Grand Theatre, how are you? It's really good to see you. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Really enjoying this. But I had a question at the beginning about your use of colour or not, no use of colour. And I'm interested to hear more on that decision, um, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I, um, I think um, the reason why I just use monochrome is to really focus in on the mark, Deirdre. Um, and I think by eliminating colour, it really allows whatever mark you make to be almost exaggerated. So it's not, it, it, it's like, that is, that's the reason why I choose it. And I, I just have never gone beyond, I've never got into colour. And um, because I'm still at that stage of really um, exploring the mark, but it's not beyond the realms of any possibilities that in the future I have another hundred years to go, I'm sure. But it's it, that's why it's really to focus in on the mark, and I think I do that by eliminating colour. Okay, thanks, a million. That's it. Um, there's a question here from an S. O'Connor, I'm not sure of the first name, but I'm wondering if whoever put in the question if they wanted to ask Marie directly. Sinead, I believe. Sinead, Sinead O'Connor, are you there? Hello. Hi, how are you? Hi, Marie. It's fantastic, Hi. fantastic work. Um, I'm just wondering about, there seems to be an element of transience in your work, in the materiality of the subject matter as well. Um, the use of, especially ash, I think it's a metaphor for death, um, and plaster and the rusting of plaster. These are all things that are changed and impermanent. And also the subject matter of the everyday, Normally we don't see that documented and it seems like there's a focus on documenting that <clears throat> and making it more permanent. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. And um, I suppose I probably wouldn't have used the word <coughs> death. I would have thought by using the burning is kind of like a liberation and a moving forward and a sort of, um, so it's not the dying of something, it's about the liberation of something, Sinead, you know? But you're, you're right about the everydayness, like definitely um, it's, it, it's picking up on something that's around us all the time and making it an extraordinary thing. And um, I think that's been me for all my life as an artist is trying to, you know, um, 
pick on what's around us and just to highlight it and to give it a sense of importance. Mm. Um, so thanks for that. No, thank you. Um, I think even in relation to that, that idea of kind of the mask produced as well, like even in your use of the masks or the, you know, the packaging that this idea of kind of the mass produced or the manufacturers mixed with the hand, not mixed with, but overlaid by the hand mark as well. Um, so another question from Barbara. Uh, Barbara, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself there and ask the question directly. Where's Barbara? Hi, I am here. I'm not here. My camera isn't on. Okay, Barbara. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Hi, Barbara. Hi, Barbara. How are you? I'm good, love. Listen, yeah, it's just particularly with those lovely plaster, those 15 by 15 plaster works, just that uh, I'm here now. Sorry, my camera is all blurry. Um, just uh, just the marks of the one sentence that you won't tell me what it is. But uh, <laughs> You can see uh, me later. Later. It's just the repetitive kind of, do you get into a state of kind of, almost like a trance-like state with some of your work? Do you... You know, I'm not saying do you have an out of body experience, but do you kind of go into a zone whereby you, um, you know, that you're just you're either in your moment or you're outside your mind. Do you know what I'm trying to ask you? Are you? Do you I, do, I absolutely do know because you have to be. You do get in. You know, sometimes you go into the studio and you, if you're if the headspace isn't right, it just all goes wrong, Barbara, and it doesn't have any meaning. Like you, you, you're making work that you want to feel has meaning. And the only way you can do that is if your hand is responding to an emotion and it, it's it's hopefully comes across in the work because otherwise you could just be just mass producing something. So it does take a moment, Barbara, and it does take a mindset and it does take a quietness. And I think that hopefully you got the sense of where the studio is and when it is such a remote and quiet space that it allows you, you're not, you're not dealing with traffic, you're not dealing with callers, you're not dealing with interruption, there is no broadband. So it allows very pure sort of relationship with your work. So Barbara, that's, that's I suppose, answers that question. I think as well, and even in the way you speak, Marie, of kind of making those marks, as Barbara mentioned, of that kind of, when I say multi-sensory, but that if you like, even in using the word rhythm of, you know, scratching, which is nearly like an onomatopoeic word of, you know, it's not just the action, but there's a sound to the word scratching. So that sense of, you know, kind of, as you've mentioned, kind of the sight, the touch, uh, the hearing as well. Um, of it being all of it, like all in, in, in embracing as such in the creation of the work. And also the, the selection of materials, like even when, when we were talking about the bowls, like, I mean, I, I, you know, you could go to Ikea and get a hundred bowls, but when I got Christian to, Christian to make the bowls, the, the, they're, they're on glazed. So there is a, already a sensory thing happening um, there as well, you know, that so even again the surface of the plaster panels it's taken time to get that absolutely right because when I cast them the other way I, the smoothness really matters for some reason and uh, Marie was very kind to give me I have it's over that shoulder there the other shoulder there uh, my own bowl from which to uh, and I think it's that thing for, for me in getting it was like this idea of a, it was nearly like a vessel which I think kind of kind of links across many of, you know, kind of the works in relation to them being kind of the trains or the containment within uh, the, the, the forms of your work. Um, so yeah, that's my bowl on the other side there. Uh, sorry, I see a hand up. Mary Louise has a hand up. Hi, Mary Louise, how are you? Hi, how are you? I'm, I'm good. very new to this, this format, so bear with me. Can you hear me? You can. We can, yeah, we can see okay. your hand up. So that's that's as good as <laughs> good as it gets. Yeah. Can I just ask Marie her decision not to um not to tell what the repeated sentence is? Um, Marie, are you there, honey? I don't know. <laughs> so I'll tell you why, Mary, because it's just too personal. That's why. And I okay. think, you know, if you disclose that. 
Um, I mean, if you want to, I can do it at a charge, Mary Louise. Like, that's not a problem. But um, well, say I'd say, Marie, that it's, I know I'm, I'm the lucky 40 year old participant, hence the video is off. But I'm the lucky person who has one of these pieces and I'm privileged to know what's written on it. And actually, it has added enormously, I feel, to the piece that I know okay. what's on it. OK, I tell you what, Mary Louise, for the purpose of. The, this is a very public event. OK, OK, very personal. So I'm making the decision, you know, just to keep zipped about keep that. It. Zip it. It's just so personal. And, um, you know, certainly if somebody, if I was to present the work to somebody, I'd have a conversation one to one. But just on this, now everybody's going this to want one. to know. But it's just, you know, it's just personal. And I don't yeah. particularly want it to be a big, this event is gorgeous. And, you know, yeah. I think it's relevant. The, but the ambiguity of the way you create the work, and as I said, that's or as you said as well, where the text hovers between being there and not there, it does abstract it into being a mark, and even the way you have abstracted the letters into being shapes, it's not necessarily about the actual words. It becomes yeah. something different. Um, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Mary. Uh, thanks, Mary Louise. Uh, I'm very conscious of work coming up to time. Uh, sorry, Marie, we're not going to get back to, I don't think we're going to get back to the... That's fine, Claire. I just think to have hear people's voices, and yeah. I really appreciate people taking their time to, uh, you know, to come into the studio and just to look at the work and to show their interest. And I think it's great to get feedback from... Absolutely. And I suppose it does with any of these conversations, you know, for, as, as an artist to kind of not reconsider their work, but... In talking about it, there is that kind of clarity of even kind of reflecting on your own work. I mean, I'm just going to read, read it just uh, some of the uh, very inspiring, indeed, a permanent sign of what we have passed away. Really amazing. That's from Antonio Diodato. Uh, Mary, Mary Foley, sorry, absolutely wonderful presentation, revving me up to go back to my collections. Mary Foley is not a hoarder either, she's a collector. Um, I suggest for children, this is from Francis Hogan, I suggest for our children to witness this, this process would be wonderful and young children generally do not get the opportunity to explore monochrome. When we look at the very young child, the very initial expression is mark making. It is very exciting for me to witness your studio. Fantastic, Marie. That's a man. Thank you. Beautiful, interesting, thought provoking. And uh, thank you for sharing your studio. Thank you for sharing. So I think Marie, with that flood of positivity around and I self declared myself and Marie are well, I would say we're very good friends and it's been an absolute privilege to be with you this morning in your studio and your uh, generosity generally it is just it is, you know, and support of uh, two others is quite incredible. So um, I just like to thank you very much for joining me this morning and joining people from all over the world. We have a few people in from the States. So um, thank you so much, Marie. And this just, we should have mentioned, sorry, it was mentioned at the start, but for anyone who couldn't make it this morning, this has been recorded. And Pia, sorry, I should have also thank Pia Holmes from the Arts Office who's doing tech backup. And this will be, has been recorded and Pia will edit it somewhat and it should go up on the DLR Arts website next week. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. And hopefully we'll see you in the coming months. As I said, the next one in June, with June and July is uh, Ursula Burke and with John Byrne. So keep an eye on the website for events. And we really hope to see you back in the Municipal Gallery very shortly. Uh, so 15th May is the date for that reopening. So thanks again, Marie. Thanks, Pia. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.